Hey, what's up? I'm John. I am a content creator and organizer for the Cyber Offensive Defensive Engineering Group. How's that for a backronym? Uh, so earlier this week in Columbus, Ohio, we had the Hack the Holidays 2018 event where a bunch of us met for uh, two hours and talked about the joys of binary reverse engineering. Um, a lot of the people that were there are, um, have a lot of experience with um, web app penetration testing. Uh, a couple of the people have their OSCP. They are extremely bright people who totally understand and get cybersecurity, but they don't do binary reverse engineering on a daily basis. And let's face it, not everyone does, but from time to time, binary reverse engineering can be extremely helpful. As a matter of fact, reverse engineering as a discipline applies to so many different uh, industries uh, and organizations and types of content. So um, what we're going to do is just have this very first introductory video talking a little bit about the practical applications of reverse engineering. And the next video, we're going to do a primer uh, of um, x86 because that's the target architecture we're going to use to get through the Hack the Holidays content. After that, we'll go um, sort of each challenge at a, as a time, at a time, and there's five challenges. And in each one of those challenges, what we're gonna do is give you strategies and talk about concepts that allow you to get your head out of the weeds and look at the forest, the big picture of what's going on. But right now, I wanna get into the purpose and practical uses of software reverse engineering. So it turns out a lot of people think reverse engineering is about reverse engineering some application and coming up with all of the C code or C++ code that made that application. Reverse engineering is about answering questions. Malware reverse engineers wanna know who did it, why they did it, what the thing can actually do, and whether or not that thing is changing over time if we can correlate multiple samples. Some of those things are much easier to do than others, um, but they're things that we commonly do. If you have a network that you're responsible for defending and you find malicious software on it, you really want to know how it got there, who wrote it, what its capabilities are, what it might have done. Like These are all questions that you'll have, and binary reverse engineering is something that can get you there or answer those questions. So um, when we think about reverse engineering, we tend to think about like one specific field, like uh, reverse engineering a video game or like some cryptographic algorithm. But it turns out that there's a lot of stuff out there that we see every single day in commercials, like Flo from Progressive here with her snapshot discount thing or whatever. There's these OBD2 sensors that plug into your uh, vehicle's OBD2 port that monitor CAN traffic. Um, this CAN traffic can tell us information about emissions on the vehicle. It can also tell us information about how hard you're accelerating and braking and turning. Uh, there's all this information that's extracted and some of that is mandated. It's stuff that has to be exposed due to regulatory um, like restrictions or laws, basically like emissions and whatnot. But it turns out that vehicles have, especially these days, um, many CAN buses, and each of those CAN buses can run at different speeds. You can have tons of different modules and sensors that are running on the car. Each of them are spewing out all of their own information at different rates. The payloads are different for each and every one of them. And to understand what all of that information means is a massive reverse engineering effort. Because I'm telling you, there's not one automobile manufacturer. Okay, there's probably some German ones out there. But I almost guarantee you that if you go to a manufacturer and you say, can you give me a list of all the arbitration IDs on the CAN network on this particular vehicle and what it all means? They'll call up some dude, Jerry, who works in the basement, who has like a Microsoft Access database or a uh, spreadsheet that has all this stuff listed and it may or may not be up to date. Even if you buy a car that's the same exact car, but it just has a slightly different trim level, the data that you'll get out of that CAN bus could be dramatically different. This is not a solved problem. It's actually really, really difficult. So organizations like Comma AI that are collecting lots of information about vehicles and correlating driving uh, data from like, like actual recorded video to CAN bus sensors and trying to make a correlation between all of that, that's a major undertaking and that's not easy. It's really, really cool stuff and we see commercials about it all the time, but nobody talks about who makes these modules and how they identify all that stuff. It turns out that there's not just one place you can't go down to Best Buy and buy a manual on CAN traffic. You have to figure it out some, some way, shape, or form, and not everybody plays nice and shares that information, right? Also, there's manufacturers in really highly competitive markets. Think about the time where uh, a developer or somebody had a, uh, a new iPhone and left it at uh, um, a bar, 
And everybody freaked out. Oh my gosh, this is a huge deal. Why is that a huge deal? Uh, it's going to be released in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Well, it turns out that intellectual property is really important and extremely valuable to other organizations in that competitive market. Whether you're looking at automobiles or cell phones or even children's toys, anytime you have this really, really competitive market where the technology that other people are developing um, could give you an edge or get you on parity with them, uh, that, that information is really, really valuable. And reverse engineering can actually get that for you. It turns out us as uh, security researchers or people who are interested in security, um, we run lots of protocols. We have connected lives. There's lots of things on our networks. Uh, this microphone that I'm talking into right now is connected via uh, USB. All of these things are streaming and speaking a protocol. There's, there's some information that's being transferred through them. And it's my right to be able to understand exactly what they are and what they're doing and what they're saying. And by reverse engineering, I can do that. You can do that. We all can. It's really awesome. And it turns out that lots of organizations, especially like you can think of like a really large bank, some like old institution that's been doing uh, software development for a really long time, maintaining lots of data, tend to have these like large legacy systems that they have to maintain. And at some point, somebody's going to come in and they're going to end up being the new expert in that system and they won't understand any of it. And the documentation's going to be poor and they won't know where to start. And they need to essentially reverse engineer everything about it to become the new expert in the system. It happens all the time. People lose documentation. They lose source code. They have a build of something, but they don't know like how to reproduce it. So there's a really cool story on Wikipedia that talks about a Soviet missile that was developed after being reverse engineered from this AIM or AIM-9 Sidewinder. It turns out that this was fired, lodged into a, a jet, it was landed, and then extracted and reverse engineered to develop their own missile based on that design. That's awesome. In the next video, we're going to talk about x86 in a nutshell, and um, that's going to be a very high level overview of the x86 architecture. After that, we'll use the knowledge that we learned to jump into a binary and we'll start looking at patterns that we actually care about and trying to relate that back to C code that it came from. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it's interesting to you. Hang along for the ride.